from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, Acting Librarian of Congress, David Mao. Mr. Blair, members of Congress, distinguished guests, good evening. Um, we are deeply honored to welcome to the Library of Congress tonight the Right Honorable Tony Blair, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and Northern Ireland from 1997 to 2007. We are right now in the Great Hall of the Thomas Jefferson Building, the historic Thomas Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. And as you can see, we are surrounded by artwork that symbolizes the progress of civilization and the traditions of knowledge and learning. And so I think it's a very, very fitting venue for us tonight to have the seventh Kissinger Lecture. Mr. Blair will be speaking in conversation with Ambassador Martin Indyk. The Kissinger Lecture was established during the li library's bicentennial year in 2000. And it was to foster, the, the purpose was to foster nonpartisan foreign policy discussion in this, our nation's capital. The lecture has been delivered by former president of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, former president of Brazil, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, former president of the French Republic, Valvi Giscard d'Estaing, as well as the former United States Secretaries of State, James Baker, George Schultz, and Mr. Kissinger himself. Tonight's speaker, Mr. Tony Blair, is a statesman with deep democratic values and a positive vision for the world's future. He's built bridges among cultures and people around the world, and during his tenure, expanded access to education and healthcare throughout his country. Mr. Blair, we admire you very much for your courage in championing security, democracy, and the rule of law. Your leadership developed unprecedented levels of cooperation between your country and ours. Um, and although you are retired from public office, you continue to commit yourself to building a better world for future generations through work with numerous foundations and leadership councils. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a great statement, Mr. Tony Blair. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, honor to be giving the, the Kissinger Lecture this evening in this um, wonderful and august building. Um, Henry Kissinger was always a great foreign policy role model of mine. Um, he's now actually a role model of mine for the aging process. Um, I always say to him, if I, if I manage to get to his age, I'll have done well. But if I get to his age with even a quarter of his intellect and brilliance, I will be truly blessed. Um, I once actually asked Henry, what's it like being Henry Kissinger? And he said to me, well, you know, he said, a, a few months back I was at a party and a woman came up to me and she said, um, Dr. Henry Kissinger, people tell me you are so fascinating, so fascinate me. <laughs> he said, that's what it's like. I said, well, I said it could be worse. Uh, so tonight, um, I'm going to give a a 20-minute lecture. Um, the subject is around Islamist extremism, which is certainly for us in Europe today the, the topic of the day. Um, and then I'm going to be in conversation with uh, Martin Indyk, who I'm delighted has, has kindly agreed to do the interviewing question and answer session of this talk this evening. And because obviously the time for me to speak is limited, um, I'm actually publishing tomorrow morning a, a longer essay, an 8,000 word essay on this topic and what I think we should do about it. So tonight of necessity what we, you will get is, the, is the, the outline and the general points, but if you want um, greater detail you will see this set out um, 
in the essay tomorrow. To defeat Islamist extremism, we need a strategy that is comprehensive. Defeating Daesh or ISIS is only a necessary beginning and force alone will not prevail. The challenge goes far wider and deeper than the atrocities of the jihadist fanatics. The Islamist ideology has also to be confronted. Today it can be, in alliance with the modernizing and sensible voices within Islam, determined to take the name and reputation of the faith of Islam back from extremists. But a continued failure to recognize the scale of the challenge and to construct the means necessary to meet it will result in terrorist attacks potentially worse than those in Paris, producing a backlash which then stigmatizes the majority of decent law-abiding Muslims and puts the very alliance that is so necessary at risk, creating a further cycle of chaos and violence. 9-11 came out of the Al-Qaeda training camps of Afghanistan, permitted to grow there by the Taliban. But today, Daesh controls an area of land in Syria and Iraq, roughly the size of the UK. It has a significant presence in Libya, around Sirte. It is a foothold in the Sinai and in several other areas. It has the allegiance of Boko Haram in Nigeria, as well as groups in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. But you can add to Daesh al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, al-Shabaab, and half a dozen other such groups. And they're all active, trained, battle-hardened, reasonably well-armed and funded. And in many cases, they're on the doorstep of Europe. It is true that our security services are vastly more equipped and experienced in dealing with the threat than in 2001. But this is also true of the enemy. They now know that a handful of gunmen prepared to kill totally innocent and random people can traumatize a nation. Does anyone doubt that if they could kill thousands, not hundreds, they would? or that they would use any means available to them to do it. The impact of terrorism is never simply about the tragedy of the lives lost. It is the sense of instability, insecurity, and fear that comes in its wake. It can paralyze a country. And in the case of nations like ours, with our proud and noble traditions of tolerance and liberty, it makes those very strengths seem like weaknesses in the face of an onslaught that cares nothing for our values and hates our way of life. Europe is facing this dilemma in a very direct way. It is with courage and compassion, bringing large numbers of refugees from the carnage of Syria and the wider Middle East into Europe. Greece alone has around 700,000 refugees awaiting clearance. The other week, the Prime Minister told me it had 15,000 people enter Greece in the space of 12 hours. We need to prepare host communities and incoming refugees for what will be an extraordinary undertaking. Of course, it would be inhumane to refuse entry, but I'm not sure we fully comprehend the size of this challenge. So what are the pillars of such a comprehensive strategy? First, the immediate task is, of course, to defeat Daesh. Paris has galvanized opinion, but we need to understand the full nature of what has to be done. They have to be eliminated on the ground, not just in Syria and Iraq, but in Libya too, and the other countries in which they are present. Together with our allies, we have to do what it takes to defeat them and defeat them completely. This will require a combination of military, diplomatic, and political measures. Now, this does not always have to center on our boots on the ground. Our forces can play a supporting role to others. But destroying the so-called caliphate is an essential part of destroying 
the concept of it as a unifying structure for extremist groups, which underpins so much of the jihadist propaganda. It is also essential to securing a just outcome in Syria, which in turn, of course, is the only solution to the refugee crisis. To begin with, many in the West thought Syria was a nightmare, but not our nightmare. Now we know we're in it, like it or not. We must show sufficient commitment to Syria to give us the leverage to be able to negotiate a settlement which will allow the country over time to progress with full respect for minorities, but without Assad. Second then, in the medium term, we have to construct the force capability internationally through a coalition of nations willing to commit their armed forces, which would allow us to fight the jihadist extremists effectively wherever they try to gain a foothold. They must know that they are never safe to plan or to expand. And third and longer term and most important, the subject of my talk tonight, we must realize that the problem is not only the violence of groups like Daesh, but the ideology of extremism behind them. It is correct that the number of jihadist fanatics is relatively small. But the numbers who buy into significant parts of their underlying worldview are unfortunately much larger. Islam, as practiced and understood by the large majority of believers, is a peaceful and honorable faith. It has contributed greatly to human existence and progress. But there has to be an end to the denial about the nature of the problem we face. Of course, a large majority of Muslims completely reject Daesh like jihadism and the terrorism that comes with it. However, in many Muslim countries, large numbers also believe that the CIA or Jews were behind 9 11. Clerics who proclaim that non believers and apostates must be killed or who call for jihad against Jews have Twitter followings running into millions. Those who believe in concepts like the caliphate and the apocalypse, so much of the Daesh propaganda, stretch deep into parts of Muslim societies. And the belief in innate hostility between Islam and the West is unfortunately not the preserve of a few. More than that, every day, millions of young people are taught a view of the world and religion completely incompatible with peaceful coexistence. As with, for example, some of the madrasas in Pakistan or the al Majiri schools of northern Nigeria, indoctrination of children is happening on a daily basis. Even in countries like my own, a recent documentary in the UK showed that there are community centers, mosques, seemingly innocuous charity organizations that are effective fronts for this ideology. My foundation's Center on Religion and Geopolitics tracks this extremism day by day. You can see the results on our website. It's fascinating, but alarming. So this ideology has deep roots, and we have to reach right the way down to uproot it. We need, for example, in a similar way to the campaign on the environment, to agree what I've called an international global commitment on education, where it is part of each nation's global responsibility to promote culture and religious tolerance and to eradicate cultural and religious prejudice within their education systems, formal or informal. Again, it is not acceptable for governments 
to support extremist groups, whether violent or not, and where hostility and hatred towards others is being promulgated, whether in mosques or community centers, it has to be exposed and stopped. Fourth, on the positive side, we have actively to support those who are confronting the religious doctrines of the extremists. There are, in fact, now many brave and serious theologians, like those from the Al-Azhar Mosque in Cairo, renowned clerics like Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, who are showing how the true teaching of Islam leads to peace and reconciliation with the modern world. But they need the weight of a concerted international effort behind them. We have to organize the use of the internet to disseminate messages of peaceful coexistence and hope, but we have to do it at scale. And we have to build the alliance between Judeo-Christian civilization and those within Islam who are prepared to lead the fight against the perversion of their faith and the extremism which goes with it. But again, we have to do this with urgency and heft, and we have to organize ourselves to do it effectively. Fifth, we sometimes look at the Middle East, and we see such a mess that we prefer to stay out. The attacks in Paris, as if we needed further reminding, show us the futility of that. The Middle East's harsh and tumultuous transition is our affair, because it is near to us, certainly in Europe, because it is where the heart of Islam beats, because we have our own large Muslim populations, because we have allies, not only Israel, but Arab nations too, who expect and deserve our support, and whose support in turn we need to succeed. And because if we don't act, then into the vacuum will step those whose interests and values may be opposed to our own. In my view, it is better to see the Middle East and indeed Islam as in a long process of transition. The Middle East to achieve rule-based economies and religiously tolerant societies, and Islam to recover its rightful place as a faith of progress and humanity. Looked at in this way, the Middle East is not an impenetrable mess to stay clear of, but a life and death struggle in which our own interests are intimately engaged. So across the region, we should be supporting those who are fighting back against the extremism. In each case, we should be promoting those who will work for a modern, an open-minded future for the Middle East and for Islam. For the Gulf states, Egypt and Jordan, these are our allies. And where our allies have their own challenges of change and modernization to go through, we should be helping them actively to evolve in order to avoid the destabilization of revolution. And where there are groups or nations who are trying to impose or export an ideology of extremism, as with Sunni extremist groups of various varieties, or Shia, as with Iran and Hezbollah, we should be again actively constraining and opposing their influence. And we should not lose sight of the continuing crucial importance of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, important in its own right, important for what a resolution of it means for the principle of peaceful existence, and important also because it stands in the way of the obvious convergence of interest between Israel and the Arab nations. In short, we should learn the lessons of the whole period from 9-11 to today and try to forge a new synthesis of foreign policy which recognizes the need for an active policy of engagement, but in a way sophisticated by our experience, not incapacitated by it. 
for Europe, there is a huge calculation to be made. This security threat is at our door. It is actually within our home. We have a paramount interest in defeating it, which is why last night's vote in the British House of Commons was so important. Europe has to create within its nation state the armed force capability to allow us not just to play our part, but where necessary to lead. And we have to educate our own citizens and those now coming into our countries on what our values and our way of life mean, why they matter to us, and why we will defend them to the last. So we need that comprehensive strategy with all these different elements brought together. Elements that aren't just about military power, but are also going to the roots of the extremist ideology that gives rise to the violence. But let me end on a note of optimism. This is a battle we will win. There is no doubt in my mind of that. From one corner of the world to another, the overwhelming majority of people, whatever their faith, want to live in harmony and peace. The Islamist fanatics will never kill the spirit of civilization. They will be defeated and we will endure. Of that I'm sure. But to defeat this fanaticism and the ideology that accompanies it will require leadership, vision, and a determination that only full measures will do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. That was, how shall I say it, fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I fascinated you. <laughs> uh, fascinating uh, because uh, as uh, coherent and compelling the strategy that you presented is, there's a, there's a gap between the very cogent argument that you make about what needs to be done and the will in the United States and the capacity in Europe to actually do it. So how, how do you actually bridge that gap if you agree that that's, that gap exists? I mean, I think it is, um, it's the same challenge here in, the, in, in my country or in Europe. And the first thing you've got to ask yourself is how serious is this problem? I mean, are we exaggerating it? Are we making it more than it really is? And that then, the answer to that then obviously implies the, the measures you have to take. My view, and I spend, you know, I spent a large time in office dealing with this issue post 9-11. I've spent the largest part of my life since leaving office, looking at it, studying it, I think this is a big problem. I think it's fundamental and it threatens our security in a profound way. So if you think that, then you have to do what is necessary. And I think if we get our, if we get our heads into a slightly different place and look at this as a long-term generational struggle, I mean, similar to the struggle we faced against revolutionary communism, if you want to put it like this, there will be many different phases of it. You will have to uh, attack the problem in many different ways. But in the end, if you believe it is really life-threatening for your country and for its stability, you have to be prepared to do what it takes. And I think it's that bridge that people find difficult for reasons I completely understand. You know, in the aftermath of 9-11, people felt, right, this is, the, this is the issue we have to tackle. But then, you know, there's a distance with time. People realize it's very tough. And I know this having gone through Afghanistan and Iraq to deal with the problem. 
But I think if we look from 9-11 to the present day, when we've tried intervening, it's been difficult. When we stayed out, it's been difficult. When we've partially intervened, it's been difficult. Now, there are two alternative conclusions from that. One is that we're just not very good <laughs> at our jobs, and the other is it's tough, <laughs> and it's going to take a long time. But I think for, for people in Europe after Paris, I think the mood has changed. One part of this gap that I'm pointing to here is, is a definitional one. Uh, you define the problem as Islamist extremism. In Washington, uh, it's called violent extremism. And there's an unwillingness to label it in the way that you have, uh, it's essentially because of the belief that this will make it harder to get the uh, Muslim world behind the effort to deal with the extremists. How do you answer that? I completely understand that. And indeed, I went through a, a period when, when this was all first happening, when I tended to that view. Um, and obviously, building an alliance with people within Islam is central to, to, to defeating this challenge, for sure. But, you know, one of the things I discovered in politics is if you go too far from what a non-political person of reasonable intelligence would think is fair and clear, then you, you don't end up dealing with the problems you, you face. So I don't think there's, I don't, you see, I don't think that it, it disables us in achieving the alliance with, within Islam to call it Islamist extremism, because that is what it is. So, and you can't divorce. I mean, do they represent the proper faith of Islam? No. But are they doing what they're doing by reference to religion? Well, they are. I mean, you, it's, that's, you know, I remember when I was dealing with the peace process in Northern Ireland and, and having a conversation with people where they said to me, you know, all this business between the Protestants and the Catholics has nothing really to do with religion. And I said, well, that's a pity because they seem to think it is. So, <laughs> we're, we're, but, so I, I mean, I, under, I, I get this completely. And I also understand why it's important you don't also stigmatize people's views because not all Islamists are violent. But I, here's what I, I, I've come to think studying this. When Boko Haram kidnap girls and treat them as, in effect, sexual slaves, I think that is connected to a much broader feeling within, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, which sees women as second-class citizens. So I don't, you know, I think if you have a, an ideology that says the West is fundamentally opposed to Islam, and its values are a threat to us and our belief system. If that's what you believe in large number, you will get a small number of people who say, well, if we are humiliated by the West in this way, we should, we should fight back. So my point is, until you destroy the narrative that underpins this, OK, we could defeat ISIS, but we'll have someone else. So that goes to one part of your strategy, which is the ideological battle. And you laid out a few points, elements of, of this. I know in your article you go into greater detail, but part of it requires mobilizing uh, Muslim preachers against the Muslim preachers that are preaching extremism. And you cited the head of the Al-Azhar Mosque in, in Egypt as, as one example of that. But I think we have the impression that those voices are pretty thin and small. And there, there is an apparent, it appears that there's an unwillingness amongst Muslim religious leaders to actually speak out 
uh, clearly and continuously. So uh, against the kind of extremism that, that uh, it, you speak of. So is, is it realistic to expect them to mobilize and how, how are we going to do it? Because it doesn't seem very successful so far. It's changing. And remember, in all of these countries, they've now got a problem themselves. I mean, the big difference and possibly um, opportunity for us in this situation is that in each of the countries, and the countries you and I know well out in the Middle East, they've all got their own internal problems today. This is their problem. And I think for a long period of time, political leadership, certainly in the Middle East, but also elsewhere, was content to channel some of the political energy for change off into this kind of Islamist ideology. Yeah, but now it's a big problem for them. And you see, I think one of the first ways you deal with the problem is get it out on the table. Okay, just make, make clear what it is that you're dealing with. So I would say I can see a lot of evidence, I would say quite a lot of evidence now, that people are getting prepared to mobilize and they are prepared to fight back. And, you know, in the end, you, you saw the, maybe the, the leading Indonesian Muslim organization the other day, which has got 50 million members, issued what was not just a, a call to reject violence and jihadism and extremism, but was a theological justification of why modernizing Islam was sensible. And so this is important. I feel this is, but you see, one of the things that I think we've got to do in the West is we've got to organize with our allies. You know, when you take the amount of stuff that's out there on the internet from the jihadists, okay, we can go and pressure the internet companies to take it down and so on, but we're fighting against a tide the whole time. But we need to be mobilizing those people who are going to put different images and metaphors and analogies out there. And there are such people. Um, so I, I'm not pessimistic about it. I just think we need to, if we think this threat is as serious as I think it is, then we need to get a different level of organization and commitment. Let's talk about ISIS. Uh, part of your strategy is to destroy ISIS. Not to defeat and degrade, but to actually destroy it. But I sense that you kind of pulled your punch there by saying, well, it shouldn't be boots on the ground or we should play a supportive role. Don't we really need boots on the ground to, to do the job that, that you think is so important here? You're going to have to have force capability on the ground. I mean, I personally think, there, and I know we already are, by the way, we are moving from a position where we're merely supporting to actually doing more active engagement. I think, let me put it in a, and I am choosing my words very carefully because we've just got authority in the UK yesterday to do airstrikes. There's a, you know, there's not an appetite, I would say, in the UK or probably here Correct. for armed force capability on the ground. But we need to consider what, if it is important to destroy them, we need to decide what it takes to do that. Now, there are people, by the way, again, allies that we can work with, but they're going to need a lot of support and help from us. And this, there is no way with this so-called caliphate that you can think of it as being you know, constrained in some way. I mean, the training camps of the of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan before 9-11 were on a much more restricted basis than these are now. And so, I, I mean, again, it depends how serious you think the threat is, but I don't think you can allow that large part of territory to be used as a training camp for terrorism. And we've got, you know, obviously from Europe, we've got thousands of our own people going there and re they come back and there are citizens. And I think also destroying the concept of the caliphate as represented by ISIS is also very important. So, There's one uh, country in the region, a NATO ally, right on the border of Syria, that it probably is the only country with an army capable of providing the troops on the ground 
uh, that could do the job with our support, and that's Turkey. But Turkey seems to prefer to fight the Kurds than they do to fight ISIS. Uh, so, you know, are they critical to this strategy? And if they are, how do you, how do you get them to step up? They are critical to it. And I actually sat with uh, President Erdogan a couple of weeks ago in, in Ankara. I mean, I think, look, they, they have their own real concerns around the Kurdish issue, which are understandable, whatever view you, you, you take of, the, of the, the future. But they also do understand now they've got a major problem with, with ISIS. And as Erdogan explained to me, they have two and a half million refugees themselves. Um, so if they don't, you know, one of the complexities of this situation is people deal with multiple problems at the same time. But I think it is possible, and I know the US government at the moment is working very hard to do this, it is possible to get the right type of alliance with Turkey that will help us in this. Um, and I think there, there is a case, again, for a, um, a safe haven or enclave um, from which the opposition can be secure and, and which can help with the refugee problem. And that's important because we need the leverage of the negotiating table for the eventual solution in Syria. And, you know, that will be a, I mean, the, the Vienna process is going to be incredibly difficult to do. But there will be no acceptable outcome that leaves Assad there for anything other than a transitional period. And, you know, the Turks understand that. As you know, Erdogan and Assad were once very close. Uh, now there's obviously a complete breach. So we will need Turkey. You need them to protect the safe haven too. I mean, yep. you've got to have troops for that purpose as well. We, we will need that to happen. But you see, here's the thing with Syria that we've, we've watched over these last years. As, as we thought it would resolve itself, and it hasn't. And now you've got a situation, particularly with Russia coming in, and obviously Iran is, is, is you know, Hezbollah on the ground is what made the difference and propped up Assad. And then when it looked as if he was crumbling again, then the Russians have come in to support him. Um, but you, you think of the refugee crisis we've got arising out of it, the numbers of people that have died, the disintegration of the country. You know, at each stage, we have thought there's a way that we could just stay out of it. But certainly in Europe, and maybe this looks different here, but in Europe today, we're, we're facing a situation where Germany may be taking, what, a million or more refugees. You know, as I say, you talk to the the Greek prime minister, and he's got 700,000 people waiting to be the clearance. How, how are we going to be able to do that effectively? And so, of course, you want, it, it would be inhumane to refuse people sanctuary who've suffered so much. But I think this, I don't think we've even begun to understand the nature of the challenge this is going to pose for us in Europe. So, so my view is, is, however difficult it is, the alternative's worse. And I think one of the problems you get to in situations like this is you come to a moment where there is a choice, but on either side, it's ugly. So this is where I think we are. So let's, let's focus on Europe for a moment. It's, there's this huge challenge from the refugees, and that refugee flow could increase quite dramatically. Uh, that comes on top of the whole problem of economic stagnation, uh, the challenge to the euro, the issue of Grexit, and the Greeks. Now we've got the potential for a British exit. Yeah. Um, so if you put that all together, it looks from an American point of view like Europe, the European experiment is in trouble. How deep is that trouble? Um, personally, I think the basic, uh, the, the, the basic rationale for Europe is as strong today as it's ever been. Uh, in a world where China will be as powerful, or more powerful than it is today, India with over a billion people, 
country like Indonesia, population three times that of Germany. You know, for European nations to keep influence in the world, they need to come together. So the rationale for Europe after the Second World War was peace, and today it's power. And I think that basic rationale is still there and it holds good. Europe's got two problems, though. The first is that the single currency was a, um, was a policy motivated by politics but expressed in economics. And it's caused huge difficulty for the members of the Eurozone and stagnation in the European economy. Secondly, Europe is close to the epicenter of all this radical Islamist um, mess. And we are not, our armed forces aren't really geared up to deal with it. So I think this is a big challenge for Europe and it can go one of two ways. You will either get what I would call the, a, a muscular center ground that, that seizes the initiative in economic terms, realizes you've got to stimulate the economy and do structural reform. In other words, not choose between austerity and reform, but combine a, um, a, a stimulus of the economy and growth with, with the, the structural form Europe needs and gears itself up. In a way, I have to say that I think President Hollande is doing quite effectively for France. Um, gears itself up to, to take this, this threat seriously. But if they don't do that, if that center does not exert itself, I think there is a real danger in Europe of a, a resurgent nationalism that could be very dangerous for the European experiment. Are you worried about British vote? Yeah, I'm worried because there's a, there's a, there is a vote. <laughs> so um, I think Britain will vote to stay in. But, you know, people sometimes ask me here, is it possible that Britain votes to leave? Which I say, well, it's certainly possible because there's a referendum. And the opinion polls at the moment are pretty 50-50. And the other thing, if this refugee crisis is not handled in the right way, then I think you could have a situation in which anti-European feeling in the UK is stronger. So in my view, it's not sensible in the end. I think the interests of Britain are hugely in favor of staying. And I think that's David Cameron's instinct as well. But um, no, it's, it's definitely a risk. We're going to go to audience questions in a moment, but I have to ask you my, my last question, which is about the issue that you and I worked on so hard uh, for so long, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. You were, of course, the quartet envoy. I was, for a little while there, the US envoy. Um, the situation is, has gone from bad to worse to worse. We now have a low-level intifada of the knives. Uh, a right-wing government in Israel that is, you know, moving, if anything, further to the right and further away from, from the two-state solution that, that uh, we were trying to promote. What do you think needs to be done there? What do you think can be done there now? Well, you got a lighter sentence than me because you were only <laughs> in a right. shorter period of time. Months. And by the way, I hope you understand that, that the work you did was, was of fundamental importance and will stand the test of time in the end. Whatever solution they come back to will be very much based on the work that you and John Kerry did, in, in my view. Because ultimately, look, my, my view of this, Martin, is that ultimately, if the issue were a simple negotiation, it would be tough but doable. You know, the idea you can't find an answer to the borders question or security, of course you can. You want to find an answer to these problems, you can find an answer to them. Even Jerusalem, by the way, I think you can. So. The problem is the context in which this is happening. And my view, just very simply, because otherwise you and I both could talk for several days on this topic. My view, very simply, is that the key to reviving the peace process lies in the region. I don't think Palestinian politics is strong enough at the moment to carry the process. And I don't think Israeli politics is strong enough to carry the process. But I think both could be helped if, with guidance from America, obviously, the, the Arab nations decided that this was a priority for them to help revive the peace process and assist in resolving these issues. 
And I do think you need the economic, the security, and the political all to go together. But then you know that. <laughs> <laughs> but it all, I mean, we come full circle. It all comes down. What you're saying is it all comes down. All of these problems come down to the Sunni Arab states and their leaders. Well, it comes down to a basic issue of cultural acceptance. I mean, I, I really do believe that. I think that is the, look, what globalization does is it throws the world closer together. And what that means is if you have a closed-minded attitude to the world, in that process of integration, you're seeing a threat and you're fighting against that. And you think that this, this moving together of the world is somehow threatening your belief system or your way of life or your community. And the alternative view is to say, look, this is a great opportunity. But the reason, quite apart from everything else, why I think the Israeli-Palestinian issue is important is what a symbol of peaceful coexistence it would be if you could solve it. But it requires, you know, there's a, there's a deep cultural division that needs to be overcome there. And, and I do think these things are all, in the end, linked together. But the, you know, the one thing I would say about, about the world today, rising out of the conflicts in the Middle East, is that it's in flux. And usually when things are in flux, there is an opportunity to shape things. So this is why I think we, you know, we need to be kind of imaginative and creative enough to build an alliance with those within Islam who share the, the understanding that in the end, you've got to open your mind to, to others and that actually trying to run countries by reference to religion is not a, you can't do that in today's multi-faith world. You've got to be religiously tolerant. If you're not religiously tolerant as a society, you're gonna go nowhere. You know, you look at the successful countries in the world, they're all countries that are open to the world. Those that shut down in the face of it, they go nowhere. So this is where I think, you know, the, the, the situation is. And in the Middle East, you know, you've got, you see, you've got this politics that has been disfigured and deformed over a long period of time. You've got these young populations. I mean, a country like Egypt is 90 million today. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it was 30 million. You know, the average age in Gaza is about 19. A quarter of the population is under the age of five. You know, you've got these young populations, this deformed politics, and then you throw into this religion and a particular very dogmatic view of religion. Well, it's potent brew. Yeah, it's, 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 it is. Let's um, go to some audience questions. The first, <clears throat> the first question is, uh, can Islamic extremism be effectively fought without a commitment to a new spirit of openness and democracy in Arab nations? Um, I think ultimately, uh, you, you certainly do need that spirit. Um, you at least need, you at least need an acceptance that societies should be religiously tolerant. Um, so you can argue about democracy, certainly in relation to some of the, uh, the Gulf states, but an open mind, certainly, there is no way there is no way out of that, I don't think. And I, I think this is, this is where we've also got to recover our own confidence in our own belief system. I mean, I, I think it's interesting. I was in, uh, in Congress earlier today and talking to several members of Congress, and I was interested in the sense people, I think it's quite important for America to understand sometimes that even though people will be very critical of America, Underneath all of that, there is also an admiration. And, you know, I will say to people, it's a great test of a country. Are people trying to get into it or out of it? <laughs> you know, I, mean, the, I mean, basically, I think your problem is immigration <laughs> as it is in ours. So I think, you know, my, my, I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong about this and far too sort of um, utopian about it, but I actually think most people if they're given the choice, would prefer to be living in a spirit of open-mindedness with, uh, with other people. And I, I, I find even in the most, you know, the countries, even in the countries where all this Islamist stuff is most rife, you know, I still believe a majority of people would be perfectly happy in coexistence. 
But this is always the way that the extremes can create the tension through violence that divides the community. But yes, I think a spirit certainly of the open mind and in the end I think of democracy is necessary. The next question is about, <clears throat> excuse me, both the United Nations and NATO and what roles they each may play in this conflict. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's very hard for the United Nations to... One of the things I'm saying today is we need to get organized. And one of the things I found when I was prime minister, but I think it's even more true today, which is probably why the G20 was created, is that the United Nations is, it's just kind of, it's, it's hard to get it to focus down and implement, you know. So it's, it's obviously important as an authoritative body because it, it, it assembles all the world's nations. But if you wanted something done, you know, you wouldn't necessarily go there first. And that's why I think on this, for example, you need something that's somewhat more ad hoc and informal. And that's why I'm suggesting, you know, the UN, for example, actually does have a good counter extremism unit, but, you know, m most countries don't operate kind of with, through it. And I feel there needs to be a lot more organization in this. And then I think when you come to the armed force capability part of it, you also need to do that. And NATO alone is not, that's not what NATO was created for. So it's, it's difficult. And I think you need, again, to look at how, for example, Europe definitely needs to up its defense capability. The fact the UK is now recommitted to minimum 2% on, on, of GDP on defense is good, but I mean, other countries need to commit. But also, it's not just the fact you've got the armed force, you've got to have the combat capability and the, um, what is necessary to fight this new asymmetric type of warfare. I think the Gulf states are already looking at how they come together, and of course they're fighting this big battle, the Saudis and Emiratis, the Qataris in, in, in Yemen. Um, and then we need American leadership, always. So I, I don't, I think NATO has a role to play in that, but I'm not sure that NATO institutionally is capable of doing it. So I, I fear that right now, given the urgency of this, we, we need to look for different ways of assembling the right coalition of purpose. It struck me though that NATO could play a role you, in, in your strategy of safe havens and no-fly zones, uh, building on the fact that Turkey is a NATO country. If you yeah. can't get UN Security Council cover, yeah. uh, that a NATO cover could actually be quite useful if you could persuade Turkey to play the role that you want it to play. Uh, on the ground, yeah, no, I, NATO I, I, right. basically uh, maintaining the, the no-fly zone. Yep, no, I, I agree. The, U, the UN side of it, I mean, it, it relates to a, a question that I had about the aftermath. It's a question that President Obama asks his aides all the time, which is, okay, let's say we go in there and defeat them again. Uh, who's going to do the job afterwards? Who's going to fill that vacuum? We saw what happened in Libya. There's a fundamental problem of uh, collapse of institutions. Hmm. And how do you rebuild the institutions and who does that? And couldn't the UN actually play an important role there? I mean, we went through this in Afghanistan and Iraq, obviously, um, and then Libya now. And one of the problems is it's not just about rebuilding institutions, often it's about creating them. Because so-called strong men were often in charge of weak states because they, they, of the way that they were run. And I think the change today, I think, that would allow us to do this better is A, we've got experience, B, we have allies, and C, we now understand that without the security element being um, in the correct place, it's impossible to do anything else. I mean, my instinct about this, though, is that we've got to, this is why I say we've got to look upon this in a different way. If we're expecting a quick result and a clean sort of, okay, now this, that's done, I think we're kidding ourselves. 
But I think sustained engagement over a period of time, though difficult, is preferable to a vacuum that is going to be filled by either extremists or other interests and powers that may have a, a, an agenda completely contrary to our own. And, and therefore, I suppose what I think ultimately is that the difficulty of doing it is not as great as the danger of not doing it. But I think this is, you know, I, I, I say to people the whole time, this is really difficult. Yeah. And Americans, listening to you, I think, a lot would say, well, we did that. We went in there yeah. and we tried to rebuild Iraq and we tried to rebuild Afghanistan and we spent a huge amount of American blood and British blood and treasure, trillions of dollars. And it didn't work. Mm. So why do you think it can work this time around, just because we know better how to do it? I think partly, but I think also because you've always got to ask the question, the, the, the counterfactual. So, I mean, leave aside Iraq for the moment, which is maybe more controversial in this sense, but if you look at Afghanistan, it would really be better if we had done nothing or if we hadn't tried to do that building. You see, when we were fighting the Cold War, I mean, if you'd said to somebody in the 70s or 80s, well, you're spending all this money fighting the Cold War, you would have said, well, <laughs> just, I'm afraid we've got to do it. And I, I, it all depends how you identify the problem. If the problem is, you know, violent extremism, a group of fanatics, then you're probably right. You but, try to contain it. Yeah. But if it isn't, and it's broader than that, then I think you do have to try and defeat it completely. And, and so I think so much of the policy consequence flows from that uh, initial analysis. And look, I don't find that, I mean, I always say to people, I approach this with huge humility. And I think, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a poor and a partisan game to get into, you know, who's responsible for this or that or whatever. But I think we've got to try in a way to, to say, well, what really have we learned from 2001? Now, if we decide that what we've learned is we should just stay out of everything, I would argue that Syria shows you that that's not a great strategy either. Um, and maybe what we can do, and this is what I was arguing in my remarks, is you can actually synthesize those two periods of policy making and construct a policy of active engagement with allies that is, as I said, sophisticated by our experience, not incapacitated by it. But I, I can't see myself that we've got an, an option in the end. And by the way, we've, we've talked a lot about the Middle East, but in my view, the single biggest threat to sub-Saharan Africa in development terms today could be this extremism. I mean, countries like Kenya, I mean, this is absolutely existential for them. You know, you have a country like Somalia or Mali or Niger or, you know, on, in the north of Nigeria. Now, you look at how we deal with that, but you've already got now almost three million people displaced in northern Nigeria. So I think, you know, one of the things I also say to Europeans is we've got to look at our own responsibilities here because we're the one, you know, you guys are a long way away from all this. Now, you're still America, so you're the, the big power, but then we need you. But, you know, we in Europe, what, what, why, if you get these Syrian refugees, how could we s say no to the refugees coming from northern Africa or the northern part of sub-Saharan Africa? Right. You have another question? We have time for two more. Um, the first is actually a question about Lebanon, uh, its role in the conflict and the probability of violence there reigniting. I think people are right to be very worried about Lebanon, and it's a tragedy for the country. It's a great country, fantastic people. Um, but, you know, it's the same issue, isn't it? You know, they're kept in a permanent state of destabilization by Hezbollah and Iran. And that's why I think you, 
you know, one of the things we have to do is we have to be pushing back against that power very strongly. Um, but if, if Lebanon were completely to destabilize, it would have a serious impact on the, the whole region, including obviously on Israel. You know, it's interesting that this is the first time that Iran has entered into our discussion, uh, which would not have been the case, uh, I think, before the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, it's kind of taken the wind out of that argument in a strange way. Uh, but is Iran part of the problem or part of the solution when it comes to the broader Middle East? Well, at the moment, for the region as a whole, I mean, it's a destabilizing influence. Now, can they be persuaded or, to, or can there be change within Iran that allows those people who obviously have a different and more moderate view, can, can we get to a stage where that, that strain of thinking prevails? I don't know. I hope so. But, you know, if you look at the activities of Iran in, I mean, in, whether in Lebanon or Syria or Yemen or the attempts to destabilize the Gulf states, even attempts to get support within Hamas, I, I mean, I'm, I find it hard to look at Iran's influence in the region and see it positively. Last question. The final question is on Northern Ireland and uh, the peace process and whether there are parallels or lessons from your experience that could be applied to the Middle East. Um, there are some, but we were very fortunate in the Northern Ireland process of having leadership on virtually every side that really wanted to do things and was, was prepared to be quite brave with their own support. David Trimble with the Unius, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness with the Sinn Féin, Bertie Ahern, the, there's the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach. Um, you know, we had a, a good constellation of, of, of leaders at that time. But there are certain lessons. I mean, one is that you have to get a framework that is fair. The second is you'll spend then a long time implementing it. Um, the third is never to give up. And, you know, I still think in the Middle East peace process, we should never give up. But I, I fear the personal consequences of carrying on the, with my head against that brick wall. But the other, <laughs> the other, great, um, <clears throat> the other great factor in, the, in Northern Ireland was the, the spirit of the Irish, obviously. And I remember um, what we used to do in, in Northern Ireland is that when we hit a a, a logjam in the negotiation, we'd, we'd take them, the, the Irish and the different parties all away for a sort of weekend to kind of brainstorm and get everyone back on track again. Get everybody drunk. Right. <laughs> I was putting that more diplomatically. But, uh, uh, but I remember there was a, an occasion in, uh, um, in 1999 when my, my wife was, was then pregnant with... Uh, um, with, the, with our child who was born in Downing Street. And during the course of one of these weekends away, one of the um, delegation from Northern Ireland came up to me and said, oh, you know, congratulations, Prime Minister, it's a wonderful thing, you know, your wife's expecting a baby. Uh, and, you know, he said, ah, well, what do you think you'll call it? And I said, well, I don't know, I think if it's a boy, I think I'll call it after my, my father, Leo. And he said, oh, that's... that's that's a lovely thought, it's a lovely thought. Anyway, my wife gave birth. We were away a month later and um, I saw this guy again and he had the fantastic suntan. Now, I don't know whether you've ever been to Northern Ireland, but <laughs> there's many great things about Northern Ireland, but you're not liable to come away with a suntan. So I said to him, I kind of, you, you look fantastic. Where did you get that suntan from? And he said, well, actually you're responsible for it. I said, uh, I'm responsible for it. He says, yeah. He said, remember that conversation I had when I asked about your wife being pregnant and asked about what you might call the child? I said, yes. He said, well, the next day I went down to the bookmakers and put a thousand pounds on the name of the child. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So that was another major reason why it succeeded as a peace process. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should thank Tony Blair very much for a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.